everyone. Uh, actually, for the, the teleportation, I think the reason why it's a little disappointing is because we teleported the state of uh, one atom, uh, a few angstroms in sort of <laughs> along a molecule to the other end of the molecule, um, which is perhaps not quite what Captain Kirk had in mind. But, um, <laughs> And it's bad news for you if you want to be teleported, but, uh, but, but you know, small beginnings. You know, the, the thing I really loved about that, the, the very first talk tonight was just how exuberant he was. I mean, you see the big grin uh, on his face as he was doing all that, all that stuff. Um, and, and I think you, you, you certainly got some sense of that as well from, from Chris's talk and from the last talk, the application of these open source uh, principles and just the, the sheer enjoyment in collaboration that, that people are taking. So I'm going to take uh, those ideas, um, well, basically build on, particularly the ideas of the last uh, talk and talk about uh, open science. Uh, Jess mentioned that I gave a talk earlier this year at TEDx Waterloo. Um, a few of you have uh, told me that you've seen that talk. There's going to be some overlap, I'll kind of warn you in advance, and there's also uh, some considerable differences. So I'm going to start off with two stories. They're actually kind of similar stories to the last one you just heard, but in very different domains. And they show how the kind of open source principles that Chris described um, can be applied within science. So the first story involves a mathematician uh, from Cambridge University named Tim Gowers. So Gowers is, in fact, one of the world's leading mathematicians. Uh, he's so being a professor at Cambridge, he's also a Fields Medalist, which is often compared to the Nobel Prize in Mathematics. Gowers is also a blogger. Not that uncommon, actually, amongst uh, leading mathematicians. There are 42 Fields Medalists living at the moment, and uh, four of them, in fact, have started blogs. That's about one in ten. Uh, how, how many people here have started a blog? Uh, okay, so maybe about the same percentage in this audience amongst the Fields Medalists. Okay, so in uh, January of 2009, he decided to run a very interesting social experiment. He uh, wrote a blog post with a very striking title, Is Massively Collaborative Mathematics Possible? And what he was proposing doing was using his blog as a medium to attack an unsolved mathematical problem completely in the open. He was going to use the blog to post his ideas and his partial progress. He said that this was a problem that he would love to solve. His hope was, of course, well, I should say, excuse me, he, uh, he also issued an open invitation inviting anybody in the world who thought that they had an idea to contribute to post that idea in the comments section of the blog. So his hope was that by combining the ideas of many minds, it would be possible to make easy work of this hard mathematical problem. So he called this experiment the Polymath Project. Well, the Polymath Project actually got off to a very slow start. Uh, in the first seven hours after he opened his blog up for comments, uh, not a single person said a word. But then a mathematician from the University of British Columbia, somebody named Joseph Solomosi, posted a suggestion. And 15 minutes after that, a high school teacher from Arizona named Jason Dyer posted a suggestion of his own. And three minutes after that, a mathematician from UCLA named Terence Tao, actually also a Fields medalist, posted a suggestion. So things were really, they were off and running at this point. Um, I was not a, I didn't participate in any substantive uh, way, but I was following along very closely right from the start. And it was just amazing uh, to see how quickly ideas would be proposed, often rapidly developed. Sometimes they'd go down you know, wrong alleys. Uh, but other times they uh, incorporate the ideas into the, the canon of knowledge. Um, in 37 days, in fact, 27 different people would write 800 substantive mathematical comments containing 170,000 words. It's a lot of mathematics very quickly. I can tell you, uh, somebody was trying to keep up, it was a lot of mathematics very quickly. Gale has described the process as being to normal research as driving is to pushing a car. So what happened at the end of the 37 days? Why did they pick that number? Well, Gowers announced on his blog that the problem was most probably solved. They still had to go back and check the details out and make sure that everything, in fact, did, did work out. And indeed, it was all OK. And they wrote a couple of papers actually describing their results. So the polymath, the, the back of the polymath problem 
had, had been broken at this point. So of course, the reason I'm bringing this up uh, tonight, why I'm telling this story, uh, is not so much because of uh, you know, the specific problem that's being solved. It's not important so much because of that particular problem. Rather, it's because, as we saw before, and as this extra example using similar principles demonstrates, it, it suggests that we can use the online tools in some sense as a kind of cognitive tool. Uh, I, I like to think of them in some sense as uh, perhaps amplifying our collective intelligence. And by that, I just mean you know, giving us the ability to speed up the solution of what would, other, well, what would otherwise be very hard or insoluble problems. Not just in a single field, not just for cancer research, not just in mathematics, but perhaps broadly across many different fields. And so there are many experiments going on in network science. Uh, we've seen one before. I've just talked about one. I want to talk about a radically different type, just to give you a bit of a flavour of some of what's going on. Okay. So the next example I want to talk about is uh, called Galaxy Zoo. Uh, does anybody is anybody a participant in Galaxy Zoo? You are. Oh, okay. How long have you been been doing it? About five minutes. I mean, I tried it. Okay. I didn't find it to be super fun. Okay. So I left after a little while. Okay. So what Galaxy Zoo is, so it's a website, like kind of the basic level, but scientifically it's a kind of a cosmological census. It was started by some astronomers at Oxford. And their idea was to recruit online volunteers, just anybody who was interested, to classify galaxy images. Okay, so why would you want to do that? Well, they had a stack of a million galaxy images. Um, it was taken by a robotic telescope uh, in uh, New Mexico. And so you know, here you have your million galaxy images and it's been taken by a robot and nobody's ever looked at most of these images. And if you just want to do basic classifications of them, you know, is it a spiral image, is it a spiral galaxy or is it an elliptical galaxy? This actually turns out to be a really hard thing uh, to do. Most of these galaxies are tiny little smudges. And it actually turns out that humans are still a, a bit better than computers at doing the classification. So these astronomers had some reasons that they wanted to do that kind of classification. Right? So they built this little application and they tried to recruit people to come along and just do this classification uh, for them. So how has this gone? Well, they've so far recorded more than 250,000 volunteers who've done 150 million galaxy classifications. Pretty good. Right? That's a lot of galaxy uh, classifications. And part of the reason that they've been able to get so many people to do this is because actually they've made a lot of interesting discoveries along the way. So I'm just going to describe one, uh, which is actually very similar, I hope you'll see, to the Polymath project, in a sense. This is the one point at which I wish I had a slide, but I, I'll just describe it for you. So you get these galaxy images, right? You've shown these galaxy images. You were shown galaxy images before. And one of the uh, participants, somebody using the handle Night Blizzard, uh, very early on in the project, saw this little green galaxy. It doesn't look like much, it's just a little smudge. Uh, but he'd been doing it for a few weeks by this point, and he knew enough to say that that looked like a slightly strange galaxy. It was very small and compact for its distance, and it was very bright for how small and compact it was. It was also unusual because it was green, um, kind of a bright green. So it was a bit peculiar. And he posted to the Galaxy Zoo forum and said, does anybody you know, recognise this? What type of a galaxy is it? I haven't seen something like this before. And not, it wasn't a type that anybody there recognised, including any of the professional astronomers who were participating. Well, over the ensuing weeks, a few other people noticed similar galaxies like this, but nobody thought anything much of it. Um, a crucial event occurred as a result of a joke, which is uh, actually a, a participant uh, Henny Van Arkel, a school teacher in uh, 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 Holland, in the Netherlands, she found one of these galaxies and she had the presence of mind to give it a name. Because it was small and green, she dubbed it a green pea galaxy. Right? And she posted to the forum with the title, Give Peas a Chance. <laughs> okay. Now, <laughs> okay, it's a silly thing to have done, but actually it turned out to be inspired because it got other people interested. First of all, they were interested in making pee jokes, um, uh, <laughs> probably the worst of which was pee stop. Um, uh, 
but also people started to get interested in finding their own. And at first, this was done in a very unsophisticated fashion. People made all sorts of mistakes. They you know, identified stars as galaxies and so on and so forth. Um, but the hunt was on. As of today, for reasons I'll describe in a minute, there are actually more than 20,000 posts involving hundreds of people uh, in this thread that she started. Most of them, at first, it's kind of quite humorous, but uh, it takes a serious turn. What happens is that gradually these amateurs teach themselves spectroscopy so they can do more and more sophisticated analyses of the galaxies. So I'm a physicist and I had to do some spectroscopy as an undergraduate. I don't understand it tremendously well, but I know the basics. And at first it's very easy for me to follow their conversation. But as they get more and more sophisticated, gradually, it becomes harder and harder for me to follow and I can't really understand a lot of what they're talking about later on. They certainly go past my basic undergraduate level um, understanding. They develop a theory of the green peas, kind of rudimentary but interesting, that you know, they know it's a new type of galaxy, uh, that it's a very bright star forming galaxy as I mentioned, that's very compact. It's surrounded by hot ionised oxygen, this is something they realised from the spectroscopy by looking at the spectra. So that actually turns out to be an absolutely crucial uh, signature. They also discovered, so why is it so bright? Well, it's because it's actually a, it's a star-forming galaxy. So our Milky Way galaxy, which is massive compared with these, there's about one or two new stars born every year. In these tiny, tiny little galaxies, less than a tenth the size, uh, there's roughly 40 new stars being formed every year. Right? So you know, this, is, this is what they discovered. And by the, the time they're you know, a few thousand posts in, they're doing sophisticated database queries against this you know, external database to find galaxies matching their complex spectroscopic, spectroscopic criteria. Pretty interesting thing for a bunch of amateurs to be doing. And there's now a little industry amongst professional astronomers writing papers about these green P galaxies. OK, so who cares about that? The fundamental thing here is that a group of amateurs discovered an entirely new class of, of, uh, of astrophysical object, a new type of galaxy, right? What do you do on your summer vacation? <laughs> uh, pretty good, I think. I mean, for a group of people who are carrying out what was essentially a, a, a hobby. It's not a Nobel Prize winning discovery or whatnot, but it's significant. It's truly significant. So this is just one example of what's come out of Galaxy Zoo. They've so far written 22 scientific papers. Just to give you, a, I want to give you a sense of some of, one of the more prolific participants. They're all very interesting. So I've, I've chosen a woman named Aida Burhez. She's written, got, had a nice profile written about her on the Galaxy Zoo blog. So she's from the Dominican Republic. She's 53. She's a grandmother of two. She lives in Puerto Rico. She classifies roughly 500 galaxies each week. She writes many forum posts. She participates in several side projects. She said of the project that she saw it on CNN, she went to the website, I went to Galaxy Zoo, and my life changed forever. It was like coming home for me. That was her comment. So just one of her discoveries, which I really like, is these things called hypervelocity stars. So these are, my understanding is that they were first discovered around 2005. What they are is stars that are essentially shooting through the Milky Way galaxy. They're not gravitation, they're moving so fast that they're not, although they're inside our galaxy, they're, they're not actually part of it. They're going to pass through and you know, go off to infinity uh, uh, millions of years in the future. So the first one was discovered around 2005. There are about 20 known today. She discovered two of those. Pretty interesting. Kind of a thing to, to be doing, again, as an amateur. Okay, so let me, let me come back to kind of the broader picture here. The way I like to think about this type of example, this sort of citizen science project, these quarter of a million people, is in some sense it's an example of a bridging institution. Uh, if you, obviously science and society isn't separate, one hopes anyway, but to some extent you can, you know, if you think of the scientific community and the rest of society, we have these bridging institutions, right? We have a few types of bridging uh, institution. Obviously, the education uh, system is a science outreach and you know, people who make documentaries. We deliver science through the marketplace, through engineers, uh, and also through policy, uh, many technocrats and the policy apparatus. But I think this is a new type of bridging institution that's building a new type of relationship 
between the broader community and the scientific community. And it's very early days. This was started just a few years ago. There are many similar citizen science projects, but a lot of them are bothered. The large scale ones, which are enabled by the internet, are relatively recent for the most part. Uh, and it's, it's impossible to say where they will go. I think it's very interesting. There are many other examples of similar bridging institutions enabled uh, by online tools. Uh, some of you may be familiar with open access journals. These are interesting because they give the general public a view into the primary scientific literature. And this is important for a number of reasons. Uh, certainly if you start to think about, for example, giving journalists access to the primary literature, or giving judges access to the primary literature, or giving engineers access to the primary literature. That's all important, it's transformative, and we don't know what the consequences will be. Science blogging is another similar example. There are science news sites. All these things are examples of new bridging institutions, which I think are very interesting. Um, and as I say, we don't know what the outcomes will be, but when you do create new institutions like this, um, it has the potential, I think, to actually change the relationship between science and society. So this is two interesting ways in which ideas about network science, about open science, can be significant. One is th this first idea that I talked about and that was talked about in the previous talk, this notion of potentially speeding up science. And then there's also this idea of potentially changing the relationship between science and society. You know, I can't say how, that, how it's actually going to play out. I think it's too early. 